you're telling me he wrote the lines about his that he, he wrote about his own death and burial like no nah, maybe not it, it doesn't make sense right you you can't make it work hmm. um and like it's it's not it's honestly the whole thing isn't trickier than that you end up with not one messed up story but you end up with like two comprehensive stories that make pretty, sense pretty, somewhat pretty reasonable doesn't work you cannot tell the story you couldn't film it we are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast your host derek lambert this is going to be a highly scholarly discussion i cannot wait to take you guys through the pentateuch and the development of it who wrote it i mean do we have any ideas when maybe i know he doesn't like to talk about dating but we might get something out of him i don't know we'll see he's he's known for this and uh i'm super excited you guys stay tuned i'm welcoming on joel baden welcome to myth vision podcast brother thanks very much i say joel baden but professor joel baden i really do appreciate it you are highly educated in this uh research here and i'm gonna go ahead just straight introduce you joel baden is a professor of hebrew bible director and center for uh, continuing education professor joel baden works widely in the field of hebrew bible with special attention to literary history of the pentateuch he is the author most recently of the books the book of exodus which i'm gonna get i'm gonna get that a biography uh that's at princeton university press uh his other books include j e and the redaction of the Pentateuch, the composition of the Pentateuch, renewing the documentary hypothesis, which is what we're going to talk about today. And that's a Yale University Press. The promise to the patriarchs, Oxford University Press. The historical David, the real life of an invented hero. <laughs> That'll be exciting. I, I definitely cannot wait to read all this. I can't wait to read all this, honestly. Uh, reconceiving infertility. Biblical Perspectives on Procreation and Childlessness, and with Candina Moss, Princeton University Press. I've been trying to get a hold of her as well, but she's always busy. <laughs> um, let's see. The Strata of the Priestly Writings, Contemporary Debate and Future Directions. And uh, let's talk your education here. You have a bachelor's at Yale University, a master's at University of Chicago, and a PhD at Harvard University. Am I missing anything? That's all. Okay. That's it? Is <laughs> Oh, that's all. You know, it's only yeah. a lot of education, a lot of stuff. So he knows uh, quite a bit of things when it comes to this field of research. And today we're discussing his book, The Composition of the Pentateuch, Renewing the Documentary Hypothesis. Notice it's being renewed. It makes me wonder if there's more than one version of this thing. So Dr. Baden, I appreciate you tuning in. This is super exciting. And I want to give a quick shout out to Digital Hammurabi, our good friend, Dr. Joshua Bowen. He wrote my name on the Lamb's Book of Life and told me that, you know, I was welcome. And you looked at that list and you said, OK, OK, his name's on the list. I'll, I'll come on the show. So I, I thank you, Dr. Josh. You are the man. Uh, I owe you big time, brother. So thank you so much for making this possible. So, Dr. Baden, Moses wrote the first five books. That's like that's well known, right? Yeah. And so I think we're done here. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's the you know that's the traditional claim. Um, it goes back a, a long time, though not as far back as people think. Um, you know, I think everybody uh, everybody's you know raised in traditional background is taught with Jewish or Christian, right? Like that's the the standard thing, right? That the books of the five books of Moses. Um, uh, but you know, there's uh, there's reasons to think that that's not the case, um, aside from the fact that. As it turns out, the right the Torah, the Pentateuch itself, never makes that claim. And of course, actually, like virtually no biblical books make claims actually about who wrote them. Uh, even you know, aside from maybe the the prophets, they get like names attached to them, right? This is what Jeremiah said. Okay, that's different. Um, but uh, you know, Moses is uh, is a character in the in the Pentateuch. He's not the he's not the author of it. Uh, and despite the sort of uh the long-standing claims that uh uh that moses was was the author right? like you know that as an idea it was has been challenged for 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 a long time in various ways right so that you know in the um even in the medieval period jewish uh jewish thinkers were like you're telling me he wrote the lines about his that he wrote about his own death and burial like nah, maybe not uh 
or you know there are some like little chronological things the famous one um uh famous one at the very beginning of the book of deuteronomy which is like moses's like moment to shine right that, like that's his big speech and the very first things it says in the book is like this is this is what moses said on the other side of the jordan uh and yeah you know, again in the medieval period people were like the other side of the jordan like you only call it the other side if you're on like the canaan side right <laughs> How do, why would Moses say the other side of the Jordan if he was the, and you know, there's little things like that. Uh, you know, I will say, you know, certainly by the 17th century, uh, certainly in the 18th century, uh, people were like, no, like this, this doesn't work. Moses, Moses can't have actually written this. I'll tell you my, uh, I love this. My favorite, my favorite argument for why Moses probably didn't write it. It's like, a, it's like a side thing, but there's a, there's a line in the book of Numbers uh, where it says, now Moses was the most humble man on earth. <laughs> and like the logic of the most humble man on earth writing that he's the most humble man on earth, like even like, yeah, even some like pretty devout, uh, devout critics were like, that doesn't feel right. Uh, so, you know, mosaic authorship, like whether it was one person or many, the idea that it was Moses who wrote it, uh, basically fallen out yeah, we're like 400 years into nobody, uh, into that not being like a accepted scholarly position anymore. When um, do you think someone, and, and this is interesting, I just kind of like want to press in whenever you get into something, I'll throw an idea out there. Of course, if someone wants to super chat a question, feel free. We won't wait till the end. We'll try to incorporate your question during this broadcast. But uh, when do you think people started saying Moses wrote the five? Do you have a general idea of when you think? I know you don't have like a date on June the yeah, 14th, yeah. you know, like. Uh, it was over breakfast one Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, no, the. Um, so it, it's interesting, right? We we sort of think that that's like an eternal idea, like that it's always been attributed to Moses. But as far as I can tell, and again, I'm not, I can't, as you said, I can't give like a specific date. But as far as I can tell, um, what happened was essentially like uh, a couple of like pieces of like like nomenclature change. So like people, even in the Bible, it's already called the right the scroll of the Torah of Moses. Um, there's already reference to it, but that doesn't mean that it's written by Moses, right? That just means it's like it's the the in, in the same way that the book of Ruth wasn't written by Ruth, right? Like um, so to call it the scroll of Moses actually doesn't necessarily mean he wrote it, but you can understand how somebody would make that, make that leap. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that that contributed in part to it. It's just like calling it that. Uh, and also the, the, the word Torah actually uh, also changed its meaning over time. Right? originally Torah was like, just, just meant like a law or a practice, right? Like, so even within the Bible, we have references to like, uh, like the Torah of the burnt offering in, in the middle, in, in like the first part of Leviticus, right? And then there's like, you know, the paragraph about like how how you do the burnt offering, right? And that's called the, the Torah, right? It's like the individual law of the burnt offering. And then like Torah get ex gets expanded to mean like a whole set of laws. So uh, the book of Deuteronomy refers to like its own laws as Torah, but like not the whole thing, not the story, just like just the law part. And then eventually, so like it keeps on growing until the word Torah encompassed everything from Genesis through mm. uh, through Deuteronomy, at which point, right, like it was one thing to say Moses is responsible for the Torah in Deuteronomy, like he speaks it, like right? that's reasonable. But once Moses, you know, once, so in Deuteronomy, it says, Deuteronomy 31, nine, uh, it says, you know, Moses wrote down this Torah. And what it means in that context is Moses wrote down the laws of Deuteronomy that he just said. But once the word Torah had expanded to mean the whole thing, now when people read Moses wrote down this Torah, they were like, oh, Moses wrote the Torah, right? And that that line becomes like the, the crux. But, uh, you know, again, it like when we figure out like how the word Torah changed in meaning, we can sort of let go of that, of that claim. Um, it's not unlike, um, you know, it's, it's not unlike the way that uh, other biblical figures get attached to kinds of writings that like they didn't actually write, but now bear their names. This may be a different show, but like David didn't write the Psalms, but we call this, but like everyone refers to the Psalms as like the Psalms of David. Uh, Solomon, uh, you know, didn't write 
Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, but like even in the Bible, it says he did. Like somebody mm-hmm. like said, like these are the Proverbs of Sol. But again, the Proverbs of Solomon doesn't even that doesn't mean Solomon wrote them. It just means like we're affiliating his name with. In any case, uh, right. Moses's authorship, long-standing thing going going pretty far back. You know, the early um, the New Testament refers to the the Torah as the books of Moses, and uh, early Jewish interpreters. Uh, were very clear, right? Moses wrote the entire Torah, though even they were like, but maybe not the last verses where he dies. <laughs> that development took up later in your book. So for those who have not uh, read it, you need to see the composition of the Pentateuch, Renewing the Documentary Hypothesis by Dr. Baden. Now I know it's a little pricey. If you can afford it, it's really worth it. I've got it down in my recommended books in the link in the description on the Amazon affiliate link. Gives me a slight kick if you guys buy something. But uh. Really, you need to see this because you build up in this, you build up this really cool case and talk about the rabbis and you say, well, you know, they, they even started one of them and you name them by name. I can't remember their names, but, uh, and he's like, uh, there's something that doesn't quite, you know, add up. And then another rabbi jumps and goes, you know, you're right. You're right. All of this is by him except this and this. And it sounds like there's this same harmonization tool Christians use of this book interprets this book bible interprets the bible kind of concepts and you point out quite often in this book a lot of contradictions you give a great first story example of joseph and i guess it'd be the good time to go into the slavery of joseph who um who took him to egypt who bought him what amalekites or were these the uh the ishmaelites i mean what what's going on here yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I started the book there in part because it's like, uh, it's a reasonably well-known story and, you know, partly because there's a whole musical about it. Um, but like, uh, it's just, it, you know, it's one example out of many, you know, the issue when you, you pick up the beginning of the story of Joseph and, you know, I think most people who are reasonably familiar with the Bible will, can tell you the basic story, right? Like Joseph pissed off his brothers and they decided to kill him and they were like, hold on, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him. And get rid of him that way and so they sell so like they sell him and they take his you know his like special fancy coat thing <laughs> and they like uh and they put the blood on it and they show it to to jacob his father and jacob therefore thinks that he's been killed by a beast but we know he's actually just like down in egypt where the story is then going to take place for a while until like the brothers come back to him um so like as with most biblical stories, if you ask someone to just sort of tell it to you, they tell it to you like that, right? Like a perfectly straightforward story. Yeah. I always read it that way. I never even, I, I didn't have the tools. You, nobody said Ishmaelites, Amalekites. What yeah. the heck it's not, is the thing is, it's not, it's not even about having the tools. It's about being trained to read in such a way that our eyes gloss over problems because we're told, right? Like, it's not even we were told, right? When you pick up a story, you like expect it to work and to make sense and to not be problematic. And so like we like instinctively fix problems when we read. And so it takes, um, it's not even like, it's not even about having special, like special advanced skills. It's just about reading it like super carefully without thinking in, ahead of time, oh, this must make sense, right? Um, we expect it to make sense, right? We should pick up every text and expect it to make sense, but we should also be like ready for it not to. So in this case, right? Uh, in this case, the, the crucial moment happens like at the, the climax of the story when Joseph's brothers take him and they throw him into a pit and then they sit down to eat a meal uh, because they're like, you know, a bunch of callous dudes who just like killed off their brother and then like sat down for for lunch. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, and then like they look up and they see uh, and they see a caravan of Ishmaelites uh, passing by on their way to Egypt. And that's when Judah is like, oh, hold on. Uh, why are we going to kill him? Like we can make some cash here. Let's, you know, and also like not have blood in our hands. Let's just sell them to these passing Ishmaelites, which all is perfectly good and makes sense in our story. And then there's this moment when it suddenly says, and then some Midianite traders passed by and pulled Joseph out of the pit. Now, Ishmaelites and Midianites may all be foreign to us, but they're not the same people, right? Um, so suddenly we're like, there's two caravans of people coming through and and the plan was to sell him to the Ishmaelites, but the Midianites take him out of the pit they've put him in. And then it says, and this is the, the most confusing, but this says, 
and they sold him to the Ishmaelites. The who sold him to the Ishmaelites? The brother's plan was to sell him to the Ishmaelites. The Midianites just pulled him out of the pit. Did the Midianites sell him to the Ishmaelites? Like, maybe. In that case, the brothers didn't get anything out of it at all. Uh, like, did they even know what had happened? I don't know. <laughs> um, and then, but then, like, the story goes on as if nothing were weird. Um, and they, like, take the coat and they do the thing. And then at the end of the chapter, it tells us that the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt. Which doesn't make any sense because someone sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites earlier, right? Was it the brothers or was it the Midianites? Whoever it was, it should have been the Ishmaelites who brought him to Egypt. And in fact, it even says earlier on, and they brought him to Egypt. And then suddenly the Midianites are the ones who are selling him Egypt. So like how, like just on the level of like trying to figure, just plot, right? Just who is doing what and when and where and how and why, like just basic like story stuff. You like, Think about like, how could you, how would you film it, right? Like it's a story <laughs> takes place, right? You should be able, you should be able to imagine, you could be able to picture it happening, right? Like how, where is anybody? Are the brothers, Ishmaelites, Midianites, and Joseph, like reading the story as it is in the biblical text, you actually can't, it, it doesn't make sense, right? You, you can't make it work. Hmm. Um, and like, it's, it's not, it's honestly, the whole thing isn't trickier than that. Like, it's 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 not more complicated than like it doesn't work like this as on the basic level of story it, it just doesn't work and so you know uh it becomes an issue of like okay well like there's a contradiction right ishmaelites here and midianites here and like well what parts of the story involve the midianites like if the two things can't go together then like what has to connect with what and you know if you sort of just like follow like set your contradictions like in, in two columns, as it were, like this can't go with this. And then you're like, well, but this part has to go with this other part of the story, right? Like the Midianites stealing him from the pit or taking him out of the pit has to go with the Midianites selling him at the end of the story. Right. And the Ishmaelites, uh, you know, all the Ishmaelite stuff has to go with Judah being like, let's sell him to these Ishmaelites. Like, so you just like put the things together and this like, miraculous thing happens and like it's it and like it's replicable right anybody can kind of do this right it helps to have somebody guiding you but like anybody can do this right you just you take the parts that don't agree and you take the parts that do agree and like you do a little horizontal separation and a little vertical continuity stuff and you end up in even in this chapter that like doesn't seem super uh like that we, we know relatively well um you end up with not one messed up story but you end up with like two comprehensive stories that make pretty, sense pretty, somewhat. Pretty reasonable stories that like each individually are telling how Joseph got to Egypt, but they, and like, they agree on stuff, right? Everyone knows, right? Joseph's brothers uh, like tried to off him, but they failed and he ended up in, in Egypt. But, you know, how did he end up in Egypt? Who took him there? Which brother was like, was the one who, you know, because at one point Reuben tries to save him and another point Judah tries to like not kill him. Anyway, it all it all ends up uh, working out really nicely, and um, you know I open with that story because it's like reasonably short. Uh, the place where scholars figured this out first was I think like probably the most famous of these, which is the flood story, um, right? In again, in like the you know seventeenth, eighteenth century, um, the part of the story that scholars were like, this just doesn't work as a story. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't, they weren't like, let's, let's look at the story of Joseph. They were like, let's look at the most, like one of the most famous stories in the entire thing where the contradictions are actually like far more blatant in a sense, even though the Ishmaelite Midianite thing is like pretty in your face. Yeah. Like the flood story, which I don't do in the book in part because it's so famous and in part because it's just so long, it would take like, you know, it's three chapters long and all the, all the other ones I look at are like one chapter because, you know, one only has so much time. Um, but, you know, the flood story is another one. It's like the flood story is one that, Everybody, everybody you stop on the street could tell you the flood story, probably, like to, to some extent, you know, uh, God said to Noah, uh, you know, everybody sucks. I'm going to destroy everything, um, you know, so I'm going to bring a flood. So get, you know, like do the build an ark, and get in it. And how many animals is everybody like you do this, right? Like I'll, I'll play with you, right? Uh, how many animals is God tell Noah to take on the ark? Derek, go ahead. Uh, how many pair, uh, pair talks about in pairs. Right. Like two. right. Yeah. A Sorry. pair of every animal there is, right? Right. Male and female, right? Why? Because like after the flood, you need them to reproduce. Okay. So 
uh, you take a pair of every animal. And then, um, and then like, uh, we all know, how long did the flood last? Like famously? Uh, four, uh, 40 days? That's it. Yeah. 40, 40, day, 40 days, right? Uh, the flood lasts for 40 days. And, um, and when, uh, and when, and when Noah sends out, like Noah sends out the bird, right? Like famously, what kind of bird is it? Uh, I think it's a dove or, a dove. yeah. Right, right. Noah sends out a dove. Three. And it's, <laughs> right, you're doing really well. And at the at the end, and right, like everything dies, and then Ark comes to rest on the mountain, and he sends out the dove and all the things, and he and he gets out, and then God says, "I promise never to do it again." And the sign of my promise is, uh, never to let it rain again or flood again, if you will. Right. And, and and so and so, what does God rainbow. create in order? Rainbow, right? And that's the, and that's where we get rainbows from. And that's the story. We're like, and everybody can tell you, and you can tell, and everyone can tell you that story. And most people could sing you the damn song, right? Like Noah, he built him, he built him, and Arky, Arky, right? Like. Um, uh, right, this like silly kid song that like tells the story. Everyone can tell you that story, and everyone has it with the same details, right? Uh, forty days and forty days and forty nights of rain, and uh, and he sends out a dove, and like and two of every animal. And if you read the text of the of Genesis, you're not going to find that stuff. Like it's there, you'll find that stuff, but you'll also find other stuff, right? Like right. in Genesis, it also lasts 150 days, mm. and he also takes on seven pairs of like clean clean animals and birds right clean means sacrificable uh and he also sends out a raven and like you couldn't like just on chronology alone you can't make it work right to how long does right. it last 40 days or 150 days i don't know like the bible says both and like there's a whole calendar and you can't like it doesn't it just does it doesn't work you cannot tell the story you couldn't film it right like you you can't right. It's it's not uh, it's simply not a coherent story and the flood story and we just did like you know there's a dove and there's a raven there's forty days one hundred fifty days there's uh, two of every animal and there's seven pairs of, the, of all the clean animals right again it falls into two contradictory columns right where they're contradictory to each other right. but they're all totally consistent this way and you get two perfectly good flood stories in that, one <laughs> right not one messed up one right. I, I just I just wanted to let you know, Flip. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. He's bringing us back to Moses for a second. I don't know if you could see this. I have to ask: Is Moses a composite character? Does he fo uh, follow pre-existing literary elements? Kind of how Moses brought the word down from God, and Jesus was the word logos from Yahweh. Uh, that jumps to the New Testament a lot, but um, but yeah, what, is he a composite character? Most scholars think he didn't exist now, and it used to be a consensus that he did. Do you think yeah. he exists? Uh, it, it exists <laughs> exists is almost it's almost the wrong category like uh so the question is this right like let's do it this way are the stories about moses in the bible historically accurate and true and the answer is no um is moses in the bible a literary character yes right he's a character in a book um and like if that's a really useful thing to remember is what we're doing is we're reading a book mm -hmm. um and Moses is a character in it. And whether, like in a sense, whether there's a historical origin there or not is kind of irrelevant to the question of like his character. Um, in the same way that, you know, I could write a historical fiction about whomever and like the person exists, but my story's not true. Um, so I don't know whether there was actually a dude named Moses at some point. Like I kind of suspect that there was in part because like, un again, not saying that the stories about him in the Bible are true. But was there a, someone named Moses who probably did something like leave Egypt, maybe with some people with him? Uh, yes, that's possible. Uh, in, in fact, I'd even say it's almost probable, if only because uh, if you were totally, totally inventing like the hero of your like early national history, right? Like um, you probably would give him not uh, like like a name that was not that one. Right, Moses is an is an Egyptian name, um, and if you were like inventing completely, uh, like your hero, you'd probably give him some sort of good Israelite name, right? Because he's an Israelite after all, like in the story. Um, so again, there's, there's a, a few things like that that make me suspect that there probably was someone named Moses at some point in history, but that means it says nothing about whether the stories about him in the Bible are true. One of the reasons, and this goes to the, actually the question that was asked about being literally composite. Um, one of the reasons that we can't say the stories in, about Moses in the Bible are true is for the exact same reason that we can't say how the flood exactly happened, 
right? Because there's not one consistent story of Moses. But what there are, are multiple stories of Moses, right? From the different right, authors of the text. And right, like if one of them is true, then the other one isn't, right? And the composite story, like suffers from all these same kinds of uh, narrative problems. And like, you know, it's a, Moses is so broad, right? Covers four books of the of the five that you know you can't you can't like point right. to any, you can't point to like the moment where it breaks down or anything. It's just like the whole thing doesn't quite work. Except you know we can point out some things like uh, like twice God tells Moses like, hey, this is my name. You can call me this now. Um, like you, you, Moses could have been the second time. Moses could have been like, check. Like heard that one already. Um, yeah. And, and then like on a, on a more like uh, limited level, if you were to go try and if you try and read, right, like the core chapters of uh, of Exodus, right, with the, the whole event on Sinai, right, where Moses is constantly going up and down the mountain, right, you might notice that there are some moments when Moses goes up the mountain and then God is like, OK, come up the mountain. And then Moses is like suddenly back down at the bottom of the mountain again, or like he's at the bottom of the mountain and then it's like, and he went back down the mountain. But like, there's, again, there's these like narrative plot problems that signal that uh, that the story is uh, is composite in all these ways. Interesting. Uh, last thing on that topic, and I, I do want to mention this, uh, Jim Majors, man. What's up, brother? He's in the chat. He's Myth Vision. Uh, Professor Baden, being as there were clearly no winners in the Genesis flood accounts, is it safe to say the rainbow given by God was a precipitation trophy? <laughs> Do I have to respond to, to jokes? Hi, Jim. Uh, uh, I interact with Jim sometimes on the Twitters. Um, uh, that's a pretty good one. Uh, right. That's all right. Yeah. So um, as far as Moses being a pre, he, he asked also like pre-existent literary uh, composite figure. You know how a lot of people will say, well, you know, Noah looks a lot of like uh, in the Enuma Elish, you know, you could look at characters and other of these stories. Do you know any stories that Moses particularly uh, mimics or has similarities to that pre or we would say are older? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the most famous is Moses's birth story. Right. The story, you know, the whole thing like uh, he, you know, he has to be hidden and he gets put in a little like uh, basket or whatever in the and put in the river and gets found. Uh, that story is like a thousand years earlier than the biblical text. At least I don't have the numbers right in front of me. That's the that's what um, that's the birth legend of the uh, Assyrian uh, king Sargon. Uh, okay. From like. I think from like the third millennium BCE um, and like, you know, and, and in Sargon's case, he's found by a goddess, I'm pretty sure. But like the same, it's, it's, it's this, it's clearly the same story, right? So it's, this is a case where the people or the person in this case writing that particular like Moses story, um, that story of his, of his birth and being hidden and all of that is clearly drawing on um, a probably relatively well-known like, much older Mesopotamian tradition and like, and taking, taking up, right? Like that kind of birth story, right? Like that's the birth story of this legendary King from Mesopotamia. So like, that's a good story for us to use for our legendary, like not King, but like lawgiver, right? It signals his importance by virtue of its participation in like this sort of well-known, like, you know, literary trope. Interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer that. And uh, moving forward, I'm taking super chats. If you guys want to has, uh, have questions. Um, so going into some issues of other contradictions, you mentioned who's Moses's dad. I, I actually did a live the other day with Dr. Uh, Robert Price, where I mentioned, you know, these contradictions reading out of your book a little. And I said, look, uh, we don't know who Moses's dad was or what mountain. Uh, like which mountain is this Morab or Horab or is this Mount Sinai? Like what is the name of Moses's dad and all these different things? Can you mention some of those as well as I think doublets play into the narratives that you were already kind of talking about, like doublet type narratives, but sometimes they're really small and sometimes they're really big. Can you give yeah. us some examples of this? And then maybe it'll segue us into, um, you know, why there's source material. We can start talking about the documentary hypothesis as we segue sure. in. Yeah. So again, like we're all trained by our traditions to like ignore stuff, 
right? Like to just read, read past it, gloss over it or explain it away somehow. Yeah. Uh, but like once you start ignoring stuff and glossing over stuff and explaining stuff away, you're acknowledging that there's stuff to ignore or gloss over or explain away, right? Like we need to remember that every time someone's like, no, no, that's not a problem. It's, I just explain it this way. What they're actually doing is acknowledging that there's something that requires explanation and isn't just like straightforward and, and nice. Um, so, you know, the Pentateuch is like, it's full. It's it's full of contradictions and, as you say, uh, doublets and and all kinds of, of other problems. Um, I did the flood uh, in like incredibly yeah. briefly just now. Uh, you know, creation, like uh, creation, 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 much, creation's kind of the big one, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and this is and this is and, and it's great. It's another one where like you could ask anybody, like, how did creation go in the Bible? And they're like, oh, that's easy, right? Like uh, seven days, right? Like first there's, you know, first there's nothing. And then God makes the things and says that that sounds good. And it's like day one, two, three, four, five, six. And on day seven, he rested. And then uh, Adam and Eve, and then like the Garden of Eden. And like, they just, you know, you just say it like, like that. <laughs> but, but like the two things don't go together, right? Like the seven day creation story in Genesis one, like you you can't fit the other one into it except by explaining it like in some sort of uh, convoluted manner. Right? The Garden of Eden and and the seven days of creation like they're just totally at odds with each other. Um, so that's like doublet and contradiction. Um, uh, God, like it's it's in, it, there's a million of them. Uh, so you're, right, you picked on some of the, the you, laws too. You picked on some of the yeah and laws too. But you picked on some of the names, right? Like Moses's father-in-law has two names. Um, the mountain where God appears and gives the laws has two names um there you know there's this thing called the tent of meeting um that uh is described twice um once in exodus and once in uh in uh sort of you know leviticus numbers and um in in and in, in the two cases it's built differently it's in a different place it has a different function uh, so that's a doublet and a contradiction there's i mean there's easy doublets right how many times does moses get water out of a rock with his uh with his staff right that happens twice in the in the bible even though like when like i don't know like he did it once and then and then and, and, and then they got thirsty again and he was like i know how to fix it. anyway he did and he does it again um uh yeah i mean there's it's 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 almost it's not that it's, it's infinite but there's a lot of it um again yeah. some of them are really small like the name of a person who cares? Some of them are like a little bigger. When and where did Aaron die? Right, it says one thing in Numbers and a different thing in Deuteronomy. Um, uh, and then, right, how did Moses get to Egypt? Um, when did God reveal His name to? Uh, when did people start worshiping uh, Israel's God by His proper name? Right, in Genesis, in, in, in you know, in Genesis they start doing it right away. In Exodus they start doing it. In in uh, we we learn God's name in Exodus three, and then again in Exodus six. Um, uh, you know, what is it that, uh, that Moses t gets on the mountain? Does he get laws? Does he get a blueprint for a tabernacle? Um, how long, you know, does he tell them the laws right then? Does he save it for later? And as you said, within the laws themselves, there's actually plenty of contradictions also, right? Uh, in Exodus, we learn, you know, wherever you want to build an altar and worship me, go for it, man. Like, that's what God says right at the beginning of those laws. And then in Deuteronomy, it's like, there's only one place where you can do that. <laughs> Or um, no other prophet. Uh, and then, yes, there will be more prophets. I, I want to say something, though. There's almost 200 people watching right now, right? And I, I'm kind of irritated, right? Because there's only 69 likes, Joel. There's only 69 likes. I, I don't know why. I'm, I'm very dislikable is the thing. So <sighs> you have a that like. button. There's probably more of those. <laughs> I got one, and I suspect just my opinion is either Christian or someone who's a conservative Jew. I think, I think it's probably digital Hammurabi. I saw those guys pop up. Oh, that's what it is. That's I know it's you hit that like button. Everybody we're going into some crazy stuff. Uh, I'm really excited because when you read his book, I mean, it's, it's over my head. I must admit it's it, it a lot of the J E D P material. Like in my head, I'm like, what genius figured this out to know what is a J and what is a E and what is a D that, that's what I'm saying. So like, you got to read it. It just blew my mind how you guys were able to do that. And um, another thing, we got a super chat. Can I ask this question? Is Abram from Ur in the E source, Genesis 15, 7, or is that a later insertion based on P? Genesis 15 starts with after this. Are we missing E's opening? Okay. So that is like a high level question, man. Uh, that's a super <laughs> high level question. So um, 
I'll answer that. And then like, it's probably worth backing up to be like, okay, Heller, J, E, P, and D, right? You've said it a couple of times. I've said it. This question is totally based on it. And like, I realize it's easy to like talk about all the contradictions and stuff and not actually get into like the meat of the thing. The development. Like, what, like, what's, the, what's the theory, right? Okay. Right. So, um, so Ben's question is a good one, right? Like in, in one place, it says that Abraham comes from, uh, comes from Ur of the Chaldeans. And then in another place that we think is from a different author, it says the same thing. Um, and so the, uh, that's a pretty good one, John. <laughs> um, I got to tell I, you. That was like, good, dude. I caught I, have, I, have, I got no problem with that. That's like, at some, at some point, like I could really grow, I could really go for it if I wanted to, but like, okay. Anyway. Um, right. Uh, welcome to Between Two Ferns. Um, okay. Uh, so, I mean, the issue is this, like the, um, it's, it's, it's Ben's question. It's one or the other, probably. Um, I think that, uh, my suspicion is that it's the one in, um, in earlier in the, in what we call P that is the, that is the insertion based on, on, on this one in Genesis 15, but I don't know that for sure. And I do think we're missing probably the beginning of the, of the E source, but I don't know that we, um, I don't know how much. Uh, okay, that was my answer to Ben. And now I have to explain to everybody else, what the hell did I just say? Um, like, what was, what was that? So here's, so like, okay, let's back up for a second, like to our, when I was talking about the flood story, right? One flood story that, that doesn't work, we can separate really nicely into two perfectly good flood stories, okay? Um, and you could just stop there and be like, oh, so there like just happened to be two flood stories and somehow they, they, they got together like this. But I also mentioned the two creation stories, right? And it turns out one of the flood stories like directly is related to one of the creation stories. And the other flood story is related to the other creation story. In other words, like they're literally connected, right? Cross references and, and all kinds of stuff. So what that suggests is we're not looking at just like random bits of stuff, but like actually longer compositions, right? Uh, something that began with Genesis one and continued on and eventually hit its its version of the flood story. And then you can you can just keep going, right? Um, you keep going, you see the, as you keep reading, right? What are the parts of the text as we read that agree with the narrative claims and presuppositions of that Genesis one flood story like trajectory? Right. Um, and, 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 and so on and so on for the next. So like, it's actually, you know, Derek, you're like, I don't know how to do this. Like you could do it. Um, like it's, it's not, it's not like uh, outside the realm of like normal reading. Like there's no trick here. It's just reading, right? It doesn't require, it helps to have the Hebrew, but like it doesn't require some sort of like advanced like degree in physics or something, right? If you simply stop and read slowly. So you like, um, you know, in any case you come to, uh, you're reading along and you and you're like, oh, well, if it says this, right? If it's telling me like an Abraham left whatever town, then like it's probably related to the story earlier where he got to that town, right? Um, that's just, you know, simple kind of like reading continuity stuff. Or, you know, if to go back to the creation flood stuff, right? If Genesis one says, uh, the, you know, part of creation was separating the waters above and the waters below, right? These like mythic primordial waters that are above and below the earth. And then in the flood story, one flood story, at one point it says, and it rained for 40 days. And the other one says, God opened the floodgates from above and below. Okay, like the, the, the one that says floodgates from above and below clearly is like referring to the cosmic uh, vision of, of Genesis one. So that kind of continuity. Again, I'm, uh, I'll give another quick example. To give a basics to explain that, though, even in the dumber terms, what you're pretty much saying is that's how we can tell that the same source material is being used and that the flood in Genesis 6 and 7, if you will, is actually referring to Genesis 1. They actually connect. So it's yeah, almost yeah. like a narrative retelling the Genesis 1 account. I mean, it, right. It is. I and mean, it isn't. In, in the case of the flood, right? Like, the opening of the cosmic waters above and below in the flood story is like clearly okay god is like uncre like undoing the creation of genesis 1 so like it's not just words right it's concepts and it's 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 story and another like really quick um example again from something i mentioned i i, I talked about there's two tents of meeting right there's one into the center of the camp um and there's one outside the camp um 
And then there's a whole bunch of other material in the, in the Pentateuch where the Israelites all go to the center of the camp, to the tent of meeting, or Moses goes out of the camp to the tent of meeting out there. Like, it's not rocket science. It's like, okay, so like a bunch of stories are connected by virtue of where they think the tent of meeting is. And another bunch of stories are connected by virtue of where they think the tent of meeting is. And like, they don't all work together, right? Like, uh, but you know, again, you, like you separate the things and then you, then you do the, the columns. If you do this over the course of the entirety of the, of the Pentateuch, uh, you end up actually not with two different, um, like not with the two narratives as we have in the creation flood, but like a third one comes in, in Genesis 15, um, I, I think. Uh, a third one comes in that like, how do I know there's a third one suddenly shows up? Because it's telling me stuff that doesn't agree with either of the two that I've already identified. And then it continues with its own stuff that like, and, and you know, you're just following it through and you, you go on and you get these three sort of interweaving with each other uh, as you read all the way through Genesis through Numbers. And then suddenly you get to Deuteronomy and like, it's got a whole bunch of different stuff to say, right? Uh, and you're like, oh, I'm reading, like, I'm reading something uh, different again. And by, and so, and, and that's, and that's it, right? And by right. the end, there's four, right? There's basically four like narratives um, that, that we can, we can pull out of the text and see that they are, like the text, the text that we have, the canonical Pentateuch is problematic, right? It's hard to read in all the ways I've described, both on like the individual like story level and on like the broader narrative level. It's like the four gospels. It's like trying to say the four gospels are perfectly lined up, put them side by side and you're going to see, hold on, how many women went to the tomb? Wait, hold on, he went outside in Gal Galilee? What, where, you know, like- oh, Right, so the, the right, it, it's, it's a good analogy because it like, it's the it's the analogy to the situation beforehand, right? Um, if, imagine if you took the Gospels and you were like, "This isn't four different takes on the same story. This is just one story." And you were like, "And I'm going to smush them all together," right? You would end up with in in your text, you'd end up with like some contradictions, right? Um, right? How many people were where? Right? You're going to know these better than I am. But like when when the Gospels don't agree on a thing. Um, if you were to try and combine them into one story, you would have disagreements in yeah. your story and you wouldn't know which one was true, right? Um, so what we have in the Pentateuch is the combination, but by following all the things that agree and disagree with each other, you end up with, uh, with, four, with four source texts, four documents that like agree internally with themselves that are pretty much continuous. I, you know, I use the words like continuous and coherent um, and like, um, and and that uh, and what and the coolest part is actually not unlike the Gospels, but you can see the way from the way that each one of them told the story. Like, what are the things that they cared about, right? What did how did they think things worked? Um, what how did they understand God God's I, you know existence, God's relationship with humanity with Israel? Um, it's not the same, right? They didn't all think the same thing in the same way that the Gospel writers didn't all think the same thing, right? Like. Um, mm. uh, <laughs> so, it's pretty useful. I just had to pop this up because Dr. Bowen made this possible. So you can't, I can't leave my boy hanging. And of course he thinks you're the best guest ever. And look, I, I watched your interview with him and I don't know if I could even compete. That's how good he interviewed you. So would you mention the legal well, issues? Maybe have some you ever of the, seen, have you ever, and have you ever seen Megan interview someone? She's dude. There's nobody like her. Nobody. <laughs> she's so chill too. Seriously. <laughs> She's just so chill. I've interviewed her one time and uh, she was a little nervous, I think. But anyway, side yeah. we're sidetracking here. But uh, can you discuss a little bit of a uh, legal section? Yeah. So <laughs> so the thing the thing to, to remember, uh, we, we sort of instinctively, and Christianity is a little bit responsible for this, uh, we separate the law from the narrative, right? We think like, in part because Christianity was like law schma, right? Um, so like uh, legal schmiegel would have been funnier. Anyway, um, uh, so like when we separate the law from the narrative, we get this like false sense of like, oh, there's story. And like, that's, you know, all this interesting stuff is going on. And then there's like these big chunks of law in there and like, they're doing their own thing. What you have to remember is every one of the laws, the big, you know, the laws all come in the, in the Pentateuch in big chunks, right? There's a big chunk in the, in Exodus 21, 23, there's the big chunk of Leviticus in the first half of Numbers, and there's the big chunk of Deuteronomy. Um, and none of those are just like, 
like you're, you're reading along and suddenly there's law code, right? Like they're right. all part of stories, right? When right, they're all right. God told Moses the laws and Moses told the laws to the people, right? Like where in the wilderness, at the mountain or 40 years later or wherever it was, but like the laws are part of the stories. So in fact, the idea that um, like Moses, uh, like when and where Moses gave the laws and what laws they were is actually part of the contradictions of the of the text. So that when we talking earlier about like oh, there's contradictions between various parts of the laws, you know, how long are you allowed to keep a slave? And, um, uh, you know, how are you supposed to observe the Passover? There's all sorts of them, like when and where and how the festivals all work. Could and, we know, include marrying foreigners or at least involving the whole Gentile theme, the others into this? Comp like, is like, one side somewhat saying don't do it? And the other side's like, look, uh, there's some flexibility. Uh, nah, actually, like I would, I think my feeling is, I think most of them were like, don't do it. It, it depends on your definition of foreigner, right? Like there's definitely okay. like the, the people who live in Canaan when the Israelites get there, no one thinks they should be marrying. Right. right? Um, others, like maybe it's like, it's actually, it's much later in the Bible, right? It's in the books of Ezra, who's like, never, no one ever. Um, right, right. But, you know, so it's a little bit, uh, it's a little different in the Pentagon. In any case, um, you've got these law codes embedded in narratives and the laws disagree with each other. And the law codes are parts of these different sources. So, um, now, again, we, like I still haven't gotten to like J E P and D, right? Like, I, so I'll just say J E P and D are the I'm just to get this out of the way. They're the names, like the little sigla, the little names that we give to the four sources of the Pentateuch. It doesn't matter why we call them that for the most part. Some of them are easy. D is the source that shows up in Deuteronomy, like I suggested, and P is the source in Leviticus that cares about the priests, right? That's why we call it P. Um, and and J and E are the other other ones, and I'm not even going to get into why they're called that because it's too complicated. Um, but so when we refer to J, E, P, and D, what we're referring to are the sources, right? These source documents that make up the, the Pentateuchal text. So the laws of Exodus 21 to 23 belong to the E source, right? They're part of E's story, right? E is going along telling a story of what, you know, where the Israelites are, the Israelites leave Egypt and they come to this mountain in the wilderness. And God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And here's the laws of making that covenant. And like that's part, all part of a story. And then the laws are embedded in it. And P has its story and the Israelites leave Egypt and they come to this mountain in the wilderness. And God's like, all right, you got to build me a, a, build me a house. We're going to call it the tabernacle. You build the house. And once you built the house, I'm going to tell you how you need to like do sacrifices and all those things. And that's the, the priestly laws, right? Uh, and they sometimes contradict the laws in uh, from E. Mostly they're just like worried about a different thing. And then, you know, like the story goes along and you get to Deuteronomy and Moses is like, Hey, so like what happened back then was we left Egypt and we got to the mountain in the wilderness and God gave me laws and I didn't tell them to you until now, right? Which is obviously contradictory with what we have in, in Exodus and Leviticus where it's nothing but laws. But in Deuteronomy, Moses is like, I held on to these. Uh, I held on to these for 40 years and now I'm going to give them to you. And so the laws in Deuteronomy are specific like to the to the context of Deuteronomy's story, the D sources story, and have full of contradictions with both the P laws in Leviticus and the E laws in uh, in Exodus. I so wonder the if the redactor is the one who's who's trying to connect it by saying, "Well, you know, I, I forgot to give it to you back here." I wonder if the redactor included that narrative format to connect it. You know what I mean? But uh, just something to think about. Yeah. So I, I I don't I don't think that's what's happening there, but I think it's worth remembering. It's worth I mean, the redactor is worth bringing up, right? Like. The fact is, if, if at some point we're like, as, as we are, if we say, you know, this isn't one thing, it was four things that have been smushed together or interwoven, right, uh, to create this one kind of wonky, like, uh, canonical story, like, someone did that. Yeah, like, that's um, what I'm saying. And, and, and like, and I will tell you that the question that I get most often, most often, um, and I talk about this stuff all the time, um, yeah. Everybody, like people generally can get on board um, with, you know, there's contradictions and I can take like any one of these stories, the Joshua, the Joseph story or um, the flood story or whatever. I can take a whole range of texts and be like, I, I can show you in a way that will convince you that there are in fact two stories here and people get on board with that. And then everyone goes, but why the hell would anyone ever do this to them? Like, why do we have two of these things? Why do we, why do we have four? What, why did somebody think I've got to make these four into one? And why did they do it in such a way that like, what I end up with is this like mess of a whole. Mm -hmm. um, like, what was the incentive for someone to do that? Um, 
and you know Good your question. question was like your question is about like how did how did how did that mechanically happen right like how did the redactor of the text like make it work together the answer is like he for sure wasn't trying to right, right? somebody who's trying to combine the two flood stories in such a way that like it's like smooths them out does not do what we have here right because what right. we have here is two totally complete flood stories where every word is preserved and they're smushed together and like you end up with like verses back to back that are like uh and you know uh and and every all flesh that was on earth died period all existence on earth died it's like you can see that somebody like took the line from one about everyone dying in the line from one and, like didn't try to make them into one sentence it was just like I'm just like keep it all and just smush it together. 